My name is Vera Reinstein. I'm the pharmacist for Alliance Behavioral Healthcare, and today we'll provide an overview of the pathophysiology of chronic pain, as well as of addiction. Having a better understanding of chronic pain and addiction will help pharmacists better care for this very complex patient population. After this program, you should be able to describe the pathophysiology of chronic pain, list factors that can influence chronic pain, and explain addiction as a biological brain disease that is chronic, relapsing, treatable, and preventable. We'll start by reviewing the pathophysiology of chronic pain. Pain is classified as either acute or chronic. Acute pain results from an injury that damages tissue, and the pain resolves when the damaged tissue heals. An important function of acute pain is to protect from further injury and to encourage rest and healing. Chronic pain is pain lasting more than three to six months, after which uh, the period beyond which an injury would have been expected to heal. In this scenario, chronic pain is no longer protective. There are three types of pain physiology that result in chronic pain, and more than one may be present in a given patient. Nociceptive pain is due to damage to tissues from trauma or inflammation, and it can be of two types of tissue, somatic or visceral. Somatic tissue pain examples include rheumatoid or osteoarthritis, gout, chronic lower back pain, and is typically described as more localized, sharp, stabbing, burning, or throbbing pain. Visceral or organ pain examples include peptic ulcer disease, myocardial infarction, or pancreatitis, and is described as a generalized ache, cramp, or pressure. Neuropathic pain is nerve pain due to damage of peripheral or central nerves. Examples include diabetic peripheral neuropathy, post-herpetic neuralgia, spinal cord injury, post-stroke pain, or phantom limb pain. Sensory hypersensitivity, also known as central sensitization, is the third type of pain and presents when there's no obvious tissue or nerve damage. This type of pain is hypothesized to be due to nerve dysregulation or dysfunction. Examples include fibromyalgia and irritable bowel syndrome. Both neuropathic and central hypersensitivity pain can often be diffuse, burning, lancinating, or electric. Just so we can understand how acute and chronic pain differ, I'll briefly review acute pain processing, also known as nociception. Acute pain starts with an injury or noxious stimulus at the sensory nerve ending, causing inflammation. The stimulus is translated into an electrical message which is conducted along the neurons. Modulation then occurs, which blocks transmission of painful stimuli by neurons originating in the brainstem. This is known as anti-nociception. Finally, there's perception, which is very complex and involves several areas of the brain, including the thalamus, sensory cortex, limbic system, and reticular activating system. When it comes to chronic pain, a noxious stimulus is not required. There are increased prostanoids at the site, which can result in allodynia, which is a painful response to a normally innocuous stimulus, such as a feather, or hyperalgesia, which is an exaggerated or increased response to painful stimulus. The result is spontaneous pain without any painful stimulus. Nerve damage sends constant pain signals. This persistent stimulation causes rewiring of pain circuits. This results in spontaneous nerve stimulation and autonomic neuronal stimulation. Sensitization can be thought of as a wind-up phenomenon where nerve fibers transmitting painful impulses to the brain are trained to deliver pain signals more effectively, and signal intensity is increased. The result is that the patient is more sensitive and feels more pain with less provocation. Loss of nociceptive control occurs. Unlike with acute pain modulation, where some signals are blocked, in chronic pain, there is no inhibition, and innocuous stimuli become painful. Loss of modulation can occur as a result of physical factors, such as deconditioning or poor sleep, chemical factors, such as nicotine, drug, or alcohol dependence, behavioral factors, such as social isolation or stress, and even from thoughts and emotions associated with depression, anxiety, 
hopelessness, or catastrophizing. Finally, another component of chronic pain can be mental overload. Pain signals ultimately enter the brain through the thalamus, the brain's master switchboard, where signals are relayed to different parts of the brain. Signals are routed to the somatosensory cortex, which is responsible for physical sensation, the frontal cortex, which is in charge of thinking, and the limbic system, which is linked to emotions. The complex interaction of all these areas define the patient's perception of pain. It has been found that perception of pain is significantly modulated by mental illness. In patients with chronic pain, up to 54% have depression, up to 50% have anxiety, up to 81% have personality disorders, up to 49%, including a large population of veterans, have post-traumatic stress disorder, and 15 to 28% have substance use disorders. Suffering increases perceived pain, and this results in pain that worsens despite injury or illness being unchanged. Chronic pain disproportionately affects those that are socially or psychologically vulnerable, including those who are less educated, poorer, more rural, marginally employed or dissatisfied with their vocation, have a history of abuse or interpersonal violence or substance use disorder, poor health, or even abnormal brain structure or function. Chronic pain is not just a biological phenomenon, of, as we've seen. It also has psychological and social contexts, and all must be addressed for effective treatment. Appropriate pain management starts with and always includes non-pharmacological treatments, such as psychological therapies, which include cognitive behavioral therapy, biofeedback, relaxation and problem solving, rehabilitative physical or physical therapies such as stretching and exercise, massage, traction, ultrasonography, gait and posture training, uh, applied heat or cold, TENS, complementary alternative medicines such as yoga, guided imagery, acupuncture, and patient self-management, which includes pacing of activity, planned rests. Many patients will need pharmacotherapy as well, based on the pathophysiologic type of pain. And while the goal is to reduce pain, more importantly, the chosen therapy must also improve function. A pill alone will not do this. For more information on the treatment of chronic pain, please see the video webinar in this series on the CDC guidelines for chronic pain treatment. Next, I'd like to briefly review the scientific understanding of addiction. So what causes addiction? It's thought to be a confluence of genetics, environment, drug, and prescriber factors. While genetic factors account for about half of a person's vulnerability to addiction, the environment a person lives in also predisposes to addiction. In addition, drug factors, like how quickly drugs get into the brain or its ability to produce euphoria, play a role. Some drugs are more addictive than others. For example, Percocet perks people up and can be very addicting for those people who feel better and energized on it. Early use and more availability to drugs predispose to addiction. Prescriber behavior is also a key factor. Those who do not adequately screen for risk, do not counsel and advise patients about risks as well as benefits, and do not adequately monitor patients on opioids, put patients at higher risk. This is a place where pharmacists can play a very important role in providing counseling and even offering screening services. Addiction in DSM-5 is known as a substance use disorder, and for opioids specifically, as opioid use disorder. Opioid use disorder is diagnosed based on the number of these behaviors over a 12-month period. A person with mild opioid use disorder meets two to three criteria, not just tolerance number nine and withdrawal number 10. Moderate would be four to five criteria, and a person with severe opioid use disorder would have six or more criteria. Let's look at these more closely. The first four criteria described impaired control over use, and the next three criteria describe social impairment caused by opioids. The last two categories include recurrent use despite risk, and then dependence. Pharmacologic dependence is a, is a physiologic response to opioids. 
so tolerance and withdrawal are expected with regular use of opioids, even in the absence of addiction. Patients prescribed opioids for pain or for medication-assisted treatment who have only tolerance and withdrawal without any other criteria are not addicted, so would not get a mild opioid use disorder diagnosis. Dependence does not equal addiction. So why can't individuals with substance use disorder just stop using? Because addiction changes their brain circuits. This slide compares a non-addicted brain on the left to an addicted brain on the right. The hallmark of addiction is craving, which changes brain circuitry, making it hard to apply the brakes to detrimental behaviors. Craving, known as salience, is intense, uncontrollable, and all-consuming, and is much stronger in the addicted brain. Control occurs in the brain executive control systems, more specifically in the prefrontal cortex, and is responsible for our ability to make decisions and to regulate our actions, emotions, and impulses. The addicted brain has decreased functioning of this control or breaking mechanism. Memory is triggered by dopamine via the pleasure pathway. This is part of the survival hierarchy. To survive, our brains are wired to keep us alive by craving that which is essential for our survival, food, water, etc. Most addictive substances are plant-based and mimic natural dopamine. Drugs release two to 10 times more dopamine than natural pleasures, such as food, family, sex, bonding with partners or children. Chemically, the message drugs of abuse send the brain is that these drugs are more important for survival, more important than food or family. Even though the prefrontal cortex knows better, cravings override the prefrontal cortex and drive the continued drug-taking behavior in a primitive survival instinct mode. All addictive substances change brain dopamine levels, regardless if it is amphetamines, cocaine, or opioids. PET scans can show this nicely. On the left is a healthy brain with red being dopamine. The middle brain shows the effect of addiction. You hardly see any red, indicating dopamine depletion. Further, there is a reduced sensitivity in this brain's pleasure and reward systems. Initially, the brain is taking substances to feel high. Once addicted, substances are needed to avoid lows. Eventually, they need more just to function and avoid withdrawal. The brain on the right shows that brains can recover, as you see the red, or dopamine, coming back after 14 months of abstinence. However, the memory of addiction never goes away, so the person is always at risk of relapse. And while it may take weeks to months for addiction to first develop, it can be almost immediate upon relapse. Just like with other disease states, relapse is not a treatment failure in addiction. If you compare other chronic disease relapse rates, addiction is similar. We do not tell diabetics on insulin who are admitted to the hospital they now failed insulin treatment. We treat them despite their suboptimal compliance with critical dietary exercise and weight loss recommendations. Similarly, opioid detox or six months of methadone doesn't cure someone's addiction. Just as an inpatient stay does not cure someone of diabetes, many individuals with opioid use disorder will require protracted or lifelong treatment. As a pharmacist, it's important to have a better understanding of chronic pain and addiction so that we may better care for this complex patient population. Thank you. Thank you.